Let's talk about mental health. If you feel like you might need support, HERS can help. At ForHERS.com, you can get access to healthcare providers who are available for your mental health and can prescribe trusted medications if they're right for you. It's 100% online. To get started, go to ForHERS.com slash Elise. That's ForHERS.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. I'm always on the hunt for products that will help me along my never-ending hair care journey, and a brand that I am so in love with is JVN from Jonathan Van Ness. One of the products I'm absolutely obsessed with is the Instant Recovery Serum. It's a deeply moisturizing hair primer that doesn't weigh my hair down at all. It fights frizz, and it protects against heat, so it's become such a big player in my routine. If you want to try JVN for yourself, and trust me, you definitely do, head to jvnhair.com and use the code Elise 20 for 20% off your entire JVN collection. Lemonada. What was the first time that I felt funny? Great question. I would love to tell you. When I was in high school, there was a group of students that started a secret improv club, and calling this club exclusive would be the understatement of the century. On a plane of cool and uncool, this club found itself on every end. This improv group was basically Fight Club. The only rule is that you don't talk about it. This is something you just become a part of slowly and unknowingly over a very long span of time. So slowly, in fact, that when I found myself at an evening of improv with this magical group of people, I felt a lot of things. Mostly fear. See, I was driven to a house that belonged to my friend's friend, and before I knew it, I was standing on a makeshift stage that this group built in some backyard, and it was covered in thrifted rugs and blankets. But the thing that surprised me the most in this backyard were the 50 folding chairs just set up facing the stage. Why did we need 50 folding chairs set up in an improv rehearsal with a couple of friends in someone's backyard? What information do I not have that literally every other person in this backyard has? So I ask, how many people are in this group? And a friend's friend says, six. And I say, does that include the 50 other people in this group? The ones that will be sitting in these chairs? Because surely we will not be performing for an audience tonight, right? Tell me we're not performing for an audience tonight, Garrett. Garrett doesn't entertain my question. I caught his expression quickly before he turned his face away from me and... It's becoming increasingly clear to me that I had answered my own question. We will be performing for people this evening. So I had two options now. I could, number one, call my mom and tell her to come pick me up because I'm scared and also probably be grounded. Or number two, I could embarrass myself in front of an audience doing something I've never done before and probably will never do again because I will be so scarred from this experience and also probably get grounded when I get home because this entire situation feels really sketchy. Number two at least came with life experience, so I proceeded with number two. I'm standing now on this homemade stage, by choice, next to acquaintances, at best. Garrett is the only person whose name I know, and I'm watching these folding chairs in front of me quickly start to fill with people. The backyard lights turn off, and before I know it, Garrett is introducing us one by one to the audience. Garrett wastes no time in kicking off the night with a variation of an improv game called Freeze Tag. It's where two people set a scene and members of the group will go in and like tap someone on the shoulder and switch out in the scene. So Garrett starts his scene with one of his friends, Jeremy. Garrett pretended to give Jeremy a treasure map and explain to him that they will be hunting for lost treasure. (laughs) My anxiety feels like it's burning literal holes in my shirt. I am frozen with fear. Mostly because it's not even dark enough outside and I can still see the whites of people's eyeballs. That feels illegal to me. So I'm watching Jeremy mime his interaction with this invisible treasure map and also Garrett and I guess a wave of adrenaline and also severe delusion crashes over me. Before my brain clocks in, my feet have moved me from my place in the semicircle to the center of the stage. I'm standing before Jeremy, tapping him on his shoulder and tagging myself into the scene on purpose. What am I doing? I don't even remember my name at this point, let alone how to use a pretend invisible map that I just stole from a stranger named Jeremy. Jeremy takes my place in the semicircle behind me, and now it's just me and Garrett and 100 visible eyeballs. 
I swallow the spit that's been pooling up in the sides of my cheeks for what I can only assume has been like four hours. And I hold my hands out to mimic Jeremy's posture before I accidentally on purpose tagged myself in. And without thinking, I just say out loud, Garrett, I can't keep coming over and helping you build your Ikea furniture, dude. These instructions get more confusing every time. Everyone laughs. I mean, everyone. My ears are ringing so loudly with the pressure that is coming from inside of my head. But honestly, I'm just so relieved in this moment that I'm not in danger. Like, this really just is an improv performance with a bunch of strangers that I guess like improv too. Did these people just grow up watching SNL like I did? Have I, like, found new friends? I remember almost nothing after that moment. Many scenes happened without my involvement, and honestly, all I could think about was the laugh I just received from strangers who owed me nothing. Their ears heard a sound that came out of my mouth, and their brains held onto it, and their body responded. That felt like pure magic to me. I didn't have nearly as much time with this thought as I wanted, but unfortunately, before I realized what was happening, one of the other group members was pulling my arm to bring me to the center of the stage. We were doing a closing game, and I like was not paying enough attention while Garrett was explaining the instructions to the audience, which in turn would have been explaining the instructions to me for the very first time. Because there was a point where everyone in the group was looking straight at me. I had no time to stop the next words from coming out of my mouth. Is that an Ikea instruction manual? (laughs) There were no laughs this time. I felt both firsthand and secondhand embarrassment for myself at the same time. I didn't even know that was possible. But I will tell you right now, it is. (laughs) It definitely is. (laughs) I wasn't invited back to Improv Night. Thank you. Okay, actually, can you just pretend that you're listening to a fully complete theme song here? I got really in my head, and I tried to make it perfect, and I couldn't. So this is going to be the theme song right here. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Funny Because It's True. My name is Elise Myers. Today, I'm talking to a guest who really is in a league of her own as a writer and a singer. We have Rachel Bloom, the co-creator and star of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. In 2019, she received an Emmy for the song Antidepressants Are So Not a Big Deal, which was featured in an episode of her show. She is also starring in a bunch of really cool new series and films this fall, Reboot on Hulu, Paul Feig's The School for Good and Evil, and Bar Fight. I personally cannot wait to check it all out. Okay, before we start, two things that are funny because they're true. Number one, Rachel first went viral with a music video called F*** Me Ray Bradbury, and it was filmed in a Catholic church, and there was an actual priest who was there to pop in and say hello. Number two, Rachel's daughter makes a special unplanned appearance, and you might also hear her a little in the background while we talk. She is so cute. Okay, let's get to Rachel Bloom. Oh my gosh, Rachel Bloom. (laughs) Hi! How are you? (laughs) I am good. I am good. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I just honestly very much admire your work. And as a female comedian, it's very exciting to talk to you and just do this today. And so I kind of wanted to hear a little bit about how your love for comedy came about. Where did it start? Well, I was a musical theater kid, but I always liked musical comedy. I always liked making people laugh. And in the back of my head, doing funny parts was the reason I I liked theater. And then I got on an improv club in high school and I started to really like that. So even though I was looking at schools for musical theater, in the back of my head, I was like, well, I, I would like to find a comedy club. And when I went to NYU, I went to NYU for the musical theater program there. I auditioned for this sketch comedy group and I got on and it was a group where you write a new sketch show once a month. And I just fell in love with writing sketch comedy. Um, It helped me organize my thoughts in ways that I hadn't before. Like the technique of sketch writing that I learned was very, in some ways, at least the way it was taught to me, kind of mathematical. And it really helped me, again, make sense of the chaos in my brain. I'm really curious to know the first time you realized that you were funny. 
You know what? You know what? Actually, the the first big thing was I, I've been funny with my family, but I don't know. It came in waves with other kids, and then in fifth grade, I decided to make a talent show act uh, for the for the school talent show called the Me Station, which was a state, which was like a TV station only with one person. And I remember I wrote it in the shower in one go. This is such an ADHD kid thing of like I wrote it in one go in the shower, oh and then God. it was set Obsessed. right, and then it was set. Okay, so I am dying inside because I don't know if Rachel knows that I have ADHD or talk about it literally all the time. And I'm trying to not cut her off because I want to like let her talk. But all I want to do is scream like, I understand what you're saying so deeply that it hurts me. <laughs> When she's like, I come up with my best ideas in the shower and sketch comedy helped her feel like she was organizing her thoughts, you know, with comedy and just in life with her ADHD. I just wanted to cut her off and be like, no, 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 I get it. No, 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 I get it. Like, don't, you don't even have to finish your sentence. Like, don't even, don't even keep talking. I get it. But then I realized that like the point of the interview is for her to keep talking. So I just was like, I'll tell them later. <laughs> so anyways, I, yeah, that's, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> and I still ideate in the shower. I still write in the bath. But it was such a like, oh, yeah, I definitely had ADHD as, a, as an 11-year-old. But I created yeah. this thing in the shower. It was also kind of a ripoff of this uh, Gilda Radner sketch, The Judy Miller Show from SNL. Like, it definitely ripped off some of that. Love that. But I did it for the talent show. And I got huge laughs. And it actually made me more popular in school because I'd been really made fun of. I was this weird kid. And then I actually like made people laugh in a thing that I wrote and kids started being a lot nicer to me. Yeah. I, I mean, okay. So first of all, I can't even tell you how much I relate. I have just wildly outrageous ADHD and I was lucky to be diagnosed as a kid. And um, so I was able to kind of get like meds and all the help, but it didn't change the fact that I was just like always unfocused or hyper focused and hyper fixated on yeah. something to the point where you become ob like obsessed with it and you have blinders on to everything around you. And the way, like me telling stories was the way that I communicated and connected with people because I couldn't do the one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I could do like a monologue at someone. And so mm. I like found that I could tell stories and it connected with people. And I wrote everything in the bath while I was doing something else. It never was yep. like, I'm going to sit and write. Yep. It was like, yep. I'm, I have to be doing a million other things and not focusing on it. And also like the least pressure I can put on myself, the more will come out of me. And so it's really fascinating that that's how you kind of realize this is something you love doing is by being accepted by people and by getting a laugh, but also feeling like you have this into society and it's freaking fun. Like you had a good time doing it. Yes. So when you were writing these sketch comedy um, pieces, like were you including music in it as well or was it just more like comedy? Not yet. It was just comedy. The musical part of me was very much separate. I remember someone's saying to me, when are you going to stop the musical theater thing and just focus on comedy? Because back in, you know, this is 2007, <laughs> um, the idea of being a multi-hyphenate wasn't really yet a thing. I got into doing stuff at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York, and there I saw people starting to make their own work. I wanted to do a sketch show that took place within the musical A Chorus Line. So I was bringing in musical stuff, but it was only sketches. But my director, because I was working with a director, she pointed out, well, at some point you need to have a song because it's a musical. And I said, oh, you're right. So I wrote one of my first comedic songs with my friend Mikey. I wrote the lyrics. He wrote the music. And when I played the song for my boyfriend, who is now my husband, I've been with my husband for 14 years, he was like, can I say something? This is really unique. This I haven't seen at the theater before why don't you make the whole show like this? Wow. And then it became a musical sketch show. What was the song? It was a song called Space Jam, uh, about the movie Space Jam, which you can find on my YouTube. Oh. That's like basically the first comedic song I wrote. I think it's so fascinating that we have musicals and we have sketch comedy, but then to combine the two at that time, the fact that it didn't exist really, or people weren't writing their own, right? Like they were performing things that were already out there. It wasn't like write your own original pieces and then perform it. Like you kind of paved the way where you were in that, right? Oh, well, God, I, I guess I kind of did, but no, it was very, at that time, pretty rare. And now with TikTok, yeah. it's exploded. 
Yeah, everyone is, is combining those. It's awesome. I don't do nearly the, the depth of writing that you do with like music and comedy together, but I will write funny, s- quick snippets of songs that are more not to be a song like, oh, I want to be a beautiful singer here. I just like combining music and comedy is just so fun. And a lot of the times you'll get the confusion from people who are like, do you want to be a musician or do you want to be a comedian? You're just like, yes. And it's funny, the confusion and also the pressure, I think, that you feel to niche down from people um, when in reality it's like, I'm not going to niche down. Like I'm going to do what I think is funny and I'm going to do what I think works and what my audience loves, but also what I love to create. And you have to find like that authentic creativity along the way and let people just enjoy it as it is and not try and force it, I think, into a little box. I don't know if you experienced a lot of that as you were writing or not. Well, I think I, I always had the point of view, which is very actory, of, of go where the gig is, go where the work is. Okay. Before Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I tried to sell two other musical TV shows. No one, no one cared. So I was like, okay, I have this thing that I do. I put songs on the internet that I'm really passionate about. I'm doing stuff at UCB that's musical. And then I'm auditioning for stuff as an actor. And I'm available for hire as a TV writer. And you just go where the work is. And then you have to create work that shows that you can do it all. Taking a break, and we'll be right back. HERS wants you to know that you no longer have to manage your mental health alone. HERS offers access to mental health care that can support you in your day-to-day. At ForHERS.com, you can get access to healthcare providers who are available for your mental health and can prescribe trusted medications if they're right for you. And it's 100% online. If prescribed, you can get your first month of treatment for only $25 and afterwards for $85 a month or $49 a month with a three-month subscription. To get started, go to forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Look, I know that getting access to the proper mental health care can sometimes be a source of stress in and of itself. That's why HERS makes it simple. Get started today at forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Offer only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Subscription required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. I'm the kind of person who likes to simplify decisions, especially when it comes to my everyday choices. I like to wear the general same outfit, comfy plain tee, comfy pants, and I do like to have the same snack, cashews and chocolate chips, if you didn't know that already. That's why AG1 from Athletic Greens just makes sense. It also simplifies things. It's a simple scoop in a glass of water every morning. It doesn't ask you to choose between a probiotic to help your gut or a multivitamin to help your energy. It does it all at once every day. With just one scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This isn't a meal replacement or a vegetable replacement. It's just a super simple way to get all of the above goodies, which help with gut health, immune system health, and nervous system health. I have friends that love it for the prolonged energy that they get throughout the day. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash Elise. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash E-L-Y-S-E to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I know that you said that you had two shows that got passed on before Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Did Crazy Ex-Girlfriend get accepted immediately or did that get passed on as well? No. Well, God, Crazy Ex has had a journey. Um, so the, the two shows that I had that were passed on, yeah. the first one, I had been writing a lot of musical sketches for Robot Chicken at that point. This is around 2012 when I was already doing stuff online with musical comedy. And I got together with this guy, Eric Weiner, who also had done musical comedy stuff online and was a longtime Robot Chicken writer. And we we shot, on our own dime, a pilot presentation that was basically a parody of TRL. And we got Brian Austin Green to star in it. Oh, my gosh. And Seth Green uh, did a character, like did, a, did an MTV VJ character in it. And then for the pilot presentation, we shot the kind of wraparounds and then we used our own music videos as, okay, here's a template of how this show would work. 
and we did it for Adult Swim, and then Adult Swim passed, and then we pitched it to a bunch of other places, and they passed. So I was like, okay, no one wants that. And then I came up with an idea for a musical show about a community theater, and then a week before I was supposed to pitch, the studio or my producer was like, never mind, this this isn't going to sell. You have to pitch another show. But I had already had pitch meetings set, and then I just came up with a new show about a girl wanting to move to New York, and I wrote a song for it, and part of my pitch was singing a song to the executives in the room, which um, was very weird when you are belting out a Broadway show tune that you've written to executives who just either range from amused to couldn't care less, and you're four feet away from them because you're pitching in an office. So that, everyone passed on that. So by the time Crazy X came around, I'd already pitched two musical shows that no one cared about. Crazy X, I co-created with Aline Brush McKenna, who, who was and is a big deal screenwriter. So when we walked into rooms, it was just a whole other ball game. People were set up to be excited about this because Aline was a big deal. Yeah. And so we had offers from MTV, FX, and Showtime. We only pitched it to cable. And we went with Showtime. And we made the pilot with Showtime. And then Showtime passed. So we had a dead Showtime pilot. And then Aline came up with the idea, hey, what if, what if we send this to the CW? They're doing cool stuff with that show, Jane the Virgin. So within about two weeks, I thought I had a dead Showtime pilot that maybe was at some point going to go on the CW, but eh, probably not, who knows, to being on stage at City Center in New York announcing the series. It happened like that. Wow. I just feel like that would be so exciting, but also so overwhelming because maybe you think you have more time to prepare and then it just happens and you're like, okay, here we go. (laughs) Well, it's all of it. It's horrifying. It's also, it becomes when you get your first big, big thing like that in the back of your head, depending on your psychology, there is an element of this is mine to lose. This is mine to fuck up. Yeah. And I had that in a more major way than some other people. And I I was able to control it and mask it and deal with it, which is a whole other thing. Um, But good things are almost higher pressure than than rejection because with good things, you actually then have to succeed. Yeah. I I know that with... um, I'm going to call it Crazy X because you called it Crazy X earlier, but I wouldn't usually shorten it. So I'm just going to do that. Okay, so this is kind of one of those things where you have a friend that you've been calling their name that they introduce themselves as, like your whole friendship, and then all of a sudden they whip out this like nickname that they started calling themselves, and you're like, do I call you by your real name or the nickname that you just used? So then you soft launch that nickname back to them out of your mouth. That was kind of me doing that with Crazy X. <laughs> Perfect. I know with Crazy X, you you do inc- you know include music, you include comedy, but you also talk about like a lot of really serious like mental health things, but you write, you make it funny with like music. But I think that you just do such an excellent job of not making it too serious, but also not too funny. How do you, like, how do you find the balance with that? Just writing it a lot. I mean, that's a, that's a just instinct. That's a, like you write by feel. That's just me and Aline in a room figuring out the tone together. Have you ever experienced people thinking that it's like not the right mix? Like, Or are people generally just like, this is great? Well, look, the people who come up to me are generally like, this is my favorite show because they're coming up to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a couple times I maybe had people complaining about something or or, or saying, sorry, my daughter's in the room, as you know. I'm on a meeting. Here, you want to sit on my lap? Sit on my lap. Okay. Help me tell this story. Um... Yeah, did we run into things on the show where people... I mean, yeah, if you look on the internet, there's criticism about anything you want on the internet. I mean, there's no there's no shortage yeah. of people being unhappy on the internet, right? Um, but but no, for the most part, I mean, people seem to dig the dig the tone. Also, we were we were a cult show, you know. It took people a long. People are still discovering us. I think it's very interesting. I'm on this Hulu show now, the show reboot. And I feel like so many more people are watching yes. it out of the gate because it's a huge, fancy cast. Creator Steve Levitan. And a lot of fancy people are watching it out of the gate. Very different than my experience of having a cult musical show on the CW. That is still in many ways gaining a following. And because of TikTok, which became a thing after the show went off the air, 
is getting a bigger following because of the songs going viral on TikTok. That's what I, I think is so interesting. Oh my gosh, your daughter is just so sweet. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> I just want to like reach out and hug her. She's so sweet. Um, I I think it's cool that social media has kind of taken shows. I, I see this with a lot of a lot of shows that I used to watch um, when I was younger, are like resurfacing now for like younger generations, and I'm just like you're finding this for the first time and it's more popular now than it even was when it was on the air. And it's like, it's just so wild to see how these shows have this longevity and they're like evergreen now when maybe they weren't before um, platforms like TikTok or Reels or whatever are just like pushing content out and sounds can be used. And I just think it's so cool. She's so sweet. Oh yes. my God. Sorry. Um, for listeners at home, no, don't be I sorry. am opening a lollipop for my daughter. You want to listen to this? Yum. This is how it works. And it's just what you do as a mom and in this space. Things don't wait. And so you're like, going to do it at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got to take a quick break, but we will be right back. ButcherBox takes all the guesswork out of finding high-quality meat and seafood that you can trust. They offer 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, crate-free pork, and wild-caught seafood delivered right to your door. With ButcherBox, everything is humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones. Also, ButcherBox has been super convenient. I am really excited at the idea of not having to scour a bunch of labels and then wait in line and lug a bunch of heavy bags home from the grocery store. Also, props to ButcherBox for having truly the most unique promotional offer I have ever heard in my life. Are you ready? The main course for Thanksgiving dinner can sometimes be the most stressful part of the holiday. Not anymore. ButcherBox is offering our listeners free turkeys with their first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash E-L-Y-S-E and use code Elise to get one 10 to 14 pound turkey free in your first box. That's butcherbox.com slash E-L-Y-S-E and use code Elise to claim this deal. Did I ever think that my first name would be used as a code for a free turkey? <laughs> Absolutely not, but I love it. Grocery shopping is something that I struggle to find time to do, but with Thrive Market, I stress less because I get everything I need and so much more in one place. And it's all delivered right to my door seamlessly. Just browsing their website and app, you will quickly notice the quality of items along with great bonus offers and discounts. Thrive Market has everything from pantry essentials to frozen meals, non-toxic cleaning and beauty products, and even items for your pet. When you buy from Thrive Market, you can save up to 30% off the best organic groceries. My favorite thing from Thrive is their boxed cold brew. Jonas and I get it and keep it in our fridge and just drink it throughout the week. It's so good. Also, their website and app are so easy to use. You can filter to find exactly what you want, maybe gluten-free, maybe zero waste, maybe BIPOC owned brands. I personally save a bunch of time when I'm looking for those fruit and veggie pouches for my son. He loves them and Thrive has so many options to choose from. Get convenient, high quality affordable groceries delivered with Thrive Market. Join Thrive Market today and get a free $60 gift. Go to T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Elise to get a free $60 gift. That's thrivemarket.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. I know that you've been really like open about kind of the misogyny, I guess, that you've experienced within your career and even not having great female audition songs like what is that like for you have you experienced it kind of at every walk of this whether musical theater or sketch comedy writing like or do you not really experience that much anymore yeah I mean I think that the world has gone through a massive shift when I was in the middle of my first writing job in 2011 that's when bridesmaids came out and I remember the articles coming out saying bridesmaids will finally prove that women are funny right now I knew women were funny yeah. but on that largest scale, it hadn't been shown before. So just think about that. That's, yeah. you know, 11 years ago, the world was like, wait, are women actually funny? Now that's stupid because <laughs> you had 30 Rock, which was of course, you know, created and starring Tina Fey. But I think that on a mass movie scale, it hadn't been considered like that, especially a, especially a, a bunch of women together, like a, a, a movie that felt yeah. very feminine. So, you know, misogyny is really, it, it's for most of American history, let alone artistic history, straight white men just set the tone. And we all kind of meet 
their tone. And it's why there are male writers out there who say, I can't write women. I've, I've met a couple of writers who go, I can't write women. I don't think they get away with it now, but a couple of years ago that, that was said to me, like, I don't know how to write women. But you couldn't be a woman and be like, I can't write men. You wouldn't get away with that. You couldn't be a person of color and be like, I can't write white people. You have to kind of meet the status quo, which is the straight white cis status quo. That's just been, you know, everything is filtered through that gaze, including musical theater. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah, you have certain narrow ways women are seen and the purpose of women in art. And I think that has really, really changed in the past 11 years rapidly. Yeah. I don't think that I realized until you just said that how revolutionary the movie Bridesmaids was. I think also because it wasn't even about the bride, which is, I think, so cool too. It was a full cast of women and it was about like the underdog, all of them, like all the bride. You know what I mean? I just, I never really realized how much of a big deal that was. And it was, it felt like, you know, as a, as a woman watching that, I'm like, this is a big deal. And I don't know why I connect so deeply to this, but it is true. Like it featured women that were funny and you're like, oh my gosh, I see myself in that. And I think that that's really, really cool. Well, because of what it did was it made it suddenly, suddenly the studio, it's money, right? The studios went, wait, this made a lot of money. We want more women stuff, women, women, women in a way that they hadn't before. Yeah. And then the same thing with um, girls. When girls came out, that was the first thing I'd seen on a major oh TV level. God. I love that show. That, that was, oh, yeah, this is how women actually speak to each other. And you can tell it's written by women and not men writing for women. A hundred percent. Like, I, I, really, I really think that girls and bridesmaids because they showed the major corporations that you could make money, which opened up the floodgates for them to suddenly say to women who'd been doing this for years, but in smaller theaters, we now want this to make us money. And look, there was a lot of backlash. I, I know a lot of people had a lot of thoughts about it, but whatever your thoughts on girls or bridesmaids are, what they did was, again, they showed major corporations, women can make you money. And that changed a lot. That's fascinating. Not everything, but but then they were like, oh, we actually want female-driven content. It wasn't like everything suddenly took off and things go in cycles. There had always been female-driven content, but I think the idea of female-driven content written by women that felt like it was stuff for women and there wasn't a male gaze to it the revelation, oh, oh, people actually want this. You can make money. I'm going to be completely honest here, almost painfully so, and it's a little embarrassing, but that's okay. Almost the entire interview, well, not the entire interview, pretty much like the first half of the interview, I really struggled with feeling protective and almost like defensive. I don't I don't know if defensive is the right word, but definitely protective because it feels like when you're a woman in comedy or or any really like, you know, job that is predominantly saturated by men, you feel like there's not enough room at the table. So you have to fight to protect your place. You speak to somebody that is so good at what they do, that does what you do, but better and more successfully you just feel defensive, right? Like you you want to guard this thing that you love so much and that you want to do forever. I also think that this is like a very learned feeling um, for women, but just for anybody that feels like they have to like swim upstream to just get to the starting line. I think that we have been taught that we are each other's competition, and that is just not true. I think it would be a huge miss for me to feel defensive speaking with another female comedian who has so much to teach me, who is so good at what she does, who could give advice, who is literally handing me inside information to a world that I want to be in and want to succeed in. She's just being generous with this information. And I feel closed off in my head about it. I think that the key thing that I really want to just make sure everybody understands is feeling that way is super normal. But also we have to not like make decisions from those feelings. 
we have to just keep reminding ourselves like there is plenty of room at the table. Okay. And cuz I know you're in reboot, um are there any other projects that you like want to create that you haven't created yet or spaces you want to venture into? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean I have a ton of projects. I have a separate pilot with Hulu that I'm waiting on. I have a sketch show that I'm waiting to pitch. I have a ton of other projects that you know, I just have to wait for the powers that be to give me money to make. But in the meantime, I'm live the I also have a live special I've been working on because I don't need any middleman to approve that. I can just go up and put up live shows and write songs for live shows now. Is it going to incorporate like stand up and music and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, it, it's and I'm and I'm already kind of putting it up and and about to see if anyone wants to actually film it. Um, I would say it's about ninety percent done. Oh my god! And I've been working it out as I perform. It's kind of stand up meets music meets a one act play. Is all I'll say. Well, one one more question. Is there anything that you love to sing to your daughter that um, is her favorite that you just bring out sometimes? So uh, about a year ago, I sang the song, I Don't Want to Live on the Moon to her. And she instantly okay. was like, again, again. And now it's the song we sing before bed every night. Just instantly, <laughs> instantly took to that song. And she, I will say oh she's already, gosh. she's musical. She has very good pitch. She makes up songs, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you make up songs? And Anna de Moon. De moon, moon, moon. And Annie Aline sing. Annie Aline, Aline Brush McKenna, my writing partner, who she calls Auntie Aline, sings her a song called Moon, 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 Shining Bright. Right? Yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> My uh, my son loves um, "Can't Stop That Feeling" from Justin Timberlake. Sure. <laughs> so that's that's our song. Great, right. I love it. Oh, she's also a big fan lately of "Mamma Mia" by ABBA. Oh, "Mamma Mia." So we've also watched some of the "Mamma Mia" movie. I mean, ABBA's great. Oh my gosh, training her very young yes. on all of the classics. Yes. I love this. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your morning, and I hope that you guys have the best time at the park, and I hope you enjoy that lollipop. And yeah, thank you so much for talking with me. This was awesome. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, of course. Okay, we did it. We did it. Oh my gosh, I wish that I could have had my son here for that interview because it was really cool to see Rachel interact with her daughter um, kind of at the tail end of our conversation. There is something so interesting about how much connecting over parenthood kind of bonds to people. Rachel is just this wealth of knowledge and experience and trial and error and success and failure and everything in between. And it is just so cool to hear her talk about her journey. And I was so grateful that I got to connect with her and also work through those feelings of of being, you know, a little bit protective over something you love and also being very open to influence and juggling both of those feelings at the same time. I love that our brains are actively and always trying to sabotage us and work against us. I'm grateful I got to talk to her today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you'd like, please rate and review the show. It helps other people find us. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, if you want more Funny Cause It's True, just subscribe to Lemonada Premium on Apple Podcasts. Funny Cause It's True is a Lemonada Media and Powder Keg production. The show is produced by Claire Jones, Zoe Dennis, Nancy Rosenbaum, and Linnea Tony. Our associate producer is Tiffany Bowie. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paul Feig, Laura Fisher, Kesla Childers, and me, Elise Myers. The show is mixed by Brian Castillo and Johnny Vince Evans. Additional help from Noah Smith and Ivan Karayev. Our theme song music was written by me and scored by Xander Singh. Hey, Lemonada listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is that they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By just answering a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. 
And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip and also keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com slash survey. The Webby Award-winning series Untold Story is back for season three. With host Trayvon Free, this season explores criminal injustice in places like Rikers Island. How have conditions there created a humanitarian crisis right in plain sight in America? With leadership failing to keep detainees safe, Trayvon speaks with criminal justice reformers, activists, and attorneys on how we can enact change throughout communities. All three episodes of The Untold Story, Criminal Injustice from Lemonada Media premiere on October 25th, wherever you get your podcasts. Casts. 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 Casts.